Hello, everyone. Welcome to another URIS webinar. Uh, today, the topic is preparing geospatial professionals for all things broadband. Uh, before we turn it over to Ashley and Eric, just a couple uh, housekeeping items. Uh, the first is that the webinar is being recorded, and, and we do plan on having that up on the URISA website. So in case you have to step away, get interrupted, uh, or uh, you think it's such great material, you want to go back and see it again or share it with other folks, uh, uh, please check for it on the URISA website in, in the next few days. Uh, second, uh, we know you'll have questions. Uh, broadband and, and uh, is one of those topics that, that uh, the deeper you dive into it, the more questions come up. And so please uh, feel free uh, to put those into chat and we'll uh, organize those and try to answer the ones that we can and come back at the end uh, and uh, have a little bit of a discussion uh, based on the questions that do come up. Uh, so that's all the housekeeping that we have. And so I'd like to turn it over to Ashley and Eric with Connected Nation to tell us about uh, all things broadband for geospatial professionals. All right, thank you so much, Matt. Um, as, as Matt said, we're from Connected Nation. Um, I'm Ashley Hitt. I'm the Vice President of Geoanalytics for Connected Nation. I've been here about 15 years and I uh, have been very involved with ERISA as well. I'm the current president-elect for ERISA, and we look forward to sharing this information to you, and I'll let Eric introduce himself real quick. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Eric Frederick. I'm the VP of Broadband Planning for Connected Nation. I've been working with Ashley now for about 11 years, uh, and I do uh, all things broadband planning and policy related, usually at a state level. I work pretty heavily in Michigan, but really across all of Connected Nation's communities and states um, as we help to, to get broadband out there. Uh, so I'll be coming up here in a little bit in the presentation, but I'll turn it back over to Ashley to kick things off. All right, thank you. So uh, before we get started, just a little bit about Connected Nation. I won't go too much into the details, but we are a national nonprofit that is focused on broadband expansion. Uh, last year, we actually celebrated our 20th anniversary. And our mission is to improve lives by providing innovative solutions that expand the access, adoption, and use of high-speed internet and its related technologies to all people. And that access, adoption, and use, those different components are very important to us because they signify different parts of the digital divide. Do people have access to the internet? Are they utilizing it? Can they subscribe to it? Um, and so we really try to take a more holistic approach of the access, adoption, and use as it uh, relates to broadband and related technologies. Um, and then I won't go too far in the, the details of this, but just the, the why, how, and the what of the things that we do at Connected Nation, um, because we do believe that everybody, regardless of where they are, whether it's urban, rural, um, where they live, how they begin, everybody deserves access and everybody belongs in a Connected Nation. So uh, we try to strive for all of the different projects and programs that we do, the different mapping and all the geospatial things that we do. How does that really uh, fit into that vision of having everybody across the country be connected. So our outline for today's webinar, uh, just a quick introduction to broadband. If you're just getting started in looking at broadband for your jurisdiction or area, or what do I need to know about it, especially as a geospatial professional, I'm getting a little bit into the details there. Also talk a little bit about the current federal data that's available for the entire country. What does that look like? What are some of the limitations? Uh, and with that, what are the challenges that exist with using that data, uh, knowing that ahead of time as you start to dive into that information, what do you need to know? And then upcoming data and programs. What is changing at the federal level that is going to prompt for more, uh, more data, better data, more details uh, that we'll be able to use? And then I'll turn it over to Eric because he will talk about more of the funding opportunities. Um, if you've tuned into more recent uh, congressional activities and different things that are coming around. There's a lot of funding that is becoming available for broadband and that is a lot at the federal level, the state level. Um, and so communities have an opportunity to, to really take advantage of all this funding that's becoming available. And so along those lines, how can you prepare? If you're a geospatial professional, uh, almost regardless of what type of organization that you work for, this can play a role in either how you're delivering content and data to your residents, or if you're trying to get broadband services for the people that live in your community. There's a lot that can be uh, prepared for and done now. And so with that in mind, 
Uh, we'll also present some information on what some states are doing currently, what some local jurisdictions are doing, different projects that they have taken on that are helping to prepare them for all of this funding that is coming. And then of course, we'll close out with the Q&A like Matt mentioned. So getting into our introduction to broadbands, I wanted to point out kind of the difference between what's referred to as last mile broadband and then middle mile broadband. Um, today's presentation will focus a lot more on the last mile component, and that's the image on the left. And what we're looking at there is the actual connection into your house, your office. You know, what provider do you have that you have a bill from every month? Um, how do you actually map all the areas that have an available connection from a specific provider, a specific technology, and what are the available maximum speeds that are available at that location. So these are the, the last mile connections that actually go into a consumer or a business um, and actually make that connection work. While the middle mile, and that's also called backhaul, is really the interconnection points between the backbone of the internet and getting to those last mile connections. So these two are definitely related, um, but just kind of the focus of being able to map who does and does not have service is more focused on the last mile broadband aspect. Um, you can also think about the middle mile connection as kind of like an interstate. If you're, you might be able to see the interstate, but if there's not a ramp right there, you can't get on and off. Um, so middle mile, the middle mile broadband or the backbone is kind of like that as well. There are different on off points that help connect to different locations and get different nodes and fiber markers to be able to connect to your physical house. Um, another thing we wanted to provide as part of the introduction is really looking at what is the current definition. So the Federal Communications Commission uh, federally recognizes that a minimum of 25 meg download and 3 meg upload speeds as the minimum considered for broadband service. And this definition has been around for a, quite a few years at this point. Uh, some people have said that it's obsolete and needs to be upgraded to a higher speed, especially based on what people need to be successful in their location. So if you're at home and you're trying to split a, a 25 by 3 connection between uh, several devices, between several people trying to do Zooms like this while also doing schoolwork and connecting to other um, devices, how much of that is being split? And that depends on the type of technology you're adopting. Um, so right now, we are looking at several different types of technologies. Um, so the bottom list there, the cable, the fiber, the DSL, that is really what's considered wireline services. And those technologies are physically connected into your location. Um, the one in the top middle, fixed wireless, that is also a fixed uh, technology where you actually have equipment at your location that's feeding off of a signal that's actually propagated through the air, so fixed wireless. Um, but then there's also a couple others, uh, certainly mobile broadband. If you've got your mobile device that's connected to the internet, um, you can certainly use that at your residence, but certainly there are limitations. There could be data caps. There could be a lot more expenses involved with that if you're trying to work off of a mobile signal or do schoolwork off a of mobile signal. Um, and then, of course, satellite. Uh, satellite has come a long way since it first launched. Uh, there's different types of satellite. But for today's presentation, we will focus mostly on the fixed technologies. So cable, fiber, DSL, and fixed wireless services as it relates to that last mile broadband that we saw just a, a minute ago. Also in terms of an introduction, we wanna know, you know who lacks broadband? Why, why has this become a, a big issue? And certainly the presentations that Eric and I have given over the past several years, we've usually had to you know, why is this important? But since the beginning of the pandemic, we really haven't had to answer that question anymore because we've seen the impact of all the people that don't have broadband access. Um, so there's certainly several different estimates that are floating around based on the agency and the underlying data, but there's several, several millions of Americans that do not have access to broadband. Uh, we also might look at 43% of low-income families. And then we start to really look into the difference of access versus adoption. Is it there, but they're not able to subscribe to it? Is it physically not there? So obviously they can't adopt it. Is there a price issue? Do they not have devices to connect to the internet? Um, so there's several different barriers to adoption or subscribing to the internet. And how does that impact the digital divide that exists nationally? We're also looking at 14.6% of rural residents and 16.9 million school-aged children. So when the pandemic first started and children and students were sent home 
to be able to do schoolwork from there. There were millions of school-aged children that were not able to connect to the internet, partly because it physically does not exist at their location, part of it because they didn't have devices. And so that certainly has uh, expanded why, you know, Eric and I don't have to talk about why this is important. We know why it's important. This is no longer a luxury. Having broadband access is essential to being a part of the current economy, the current schoolwork, government services, um, us as geospatial professionals being able to operate from remote locations um, and being able to collaborate and uh, communicate together in the current economy. I now want to transition into the current federal data. So the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, has managed for several years a data set that they refer to as Form 477. And this is a twice a year filing that all the broadband providers across the country are supposed to submit their information to the FCC twice a year and say, here is where I am able to offer specific services, certain technologies, and what are the max speeds that are offered by area? Um, and then is that by residential services, business services, or both? Um, so I've added the link here. So it's broadbandmap.fcc.gov. And so they currently have data available. They've got maps and information, statistics, all available for anyone to use and see that information. The unfortunate part is that the current federal broadband data is inadequate for local planning. Uh, so being able to look at your jurisdiction and really try to make a plan for here are the served areas versus the unserved areas, unfortunately, this data does not cut it. Um, so some of the primary challenges, unfortunately, not all the providers are submitting data as required um, in the research that we have done and the projects that we've had across all different kinds of states or local uh, communities we have found that there are providers that are missing, whether they believe they're not supposed to be submitting it or they're not, uh, they don't qualify under the definition of mandatory. Uh, there's a couple of different issues there that are going around, but not all the providers are submitting that data. So there's missing information. Not all providers have GIS capabilities, um, which may sound, sound ironic to us as geospatial professionals that something so location-based that has so much location intelligence behind it, they don't are, are not using or actively using geospatial technologies, that seems a little bit crazy. Um, but there are a lot of these providers that we've worked with that they manage and maintain their network information in different ways. And so we try to work with them with whatever data or information they may have to then create information that's a little bit more standard across the board as far as identifying areas that are served, underserved, and unserved so that we can aggregate all of that, run these analyses and really figure out where the gaps are so we know where to focus the energy and efforts and funding to get them, um, get them really connected. Another unfortunate part is that the fixed broadband data is actually only filed as a CSV. Um, so there's really not any geospatial components of it. It's all census block based, so it's census block ID codes in that CSV and unfortunately not a visualization that those providers are able to see to confirm that it is correct on a map. The fixed wireless services are also only filed as census, blocks, census block list. And so I'll show an example of actually creating signal maps and propagations of where that signal actually does reach because it is completely independent of census blocks, unfortunately. So how do we get better and more detailed mapping about where services physically are available? There's also inherent overstatement with census blocks as a unit of measure. As I mentioned, telecom networks are completely independent of census block boundaries. And so using that, even though it is the smallest unit of geography available from the census, it still doesn't really define a broadband service area very well. Uh, especially when we consider that there's over 3000 census blocks across the country that are bigger than Washington DC. So when we're trying to find lo specific locations and addresses that don't have broadband service, using a census block as a unit of measure is not the best approach. Uh, and then certainly as we get into more rural areas, the census blocks become bigger and how are we you know, trying to use that type of information to determine where funding and efforts should go. We also have understatement issues because of the missing provider data. So I mentioned people uh, or providers rather are not submitting all the data that they should. And so we're missing providers. We're also finding that there are issues within providers that do submit that data. They might not be incorporating all of the census blocks that they should be submitting. They might be submitting too many census blocks. So there's definitely a give and take on the accuracy of that information. And also, unfortunately, the data can be old by the time it is published. Uh, currently, the FCC has published data that's current as of December 2020. And then obviously now it's May 2022. There's a lot of funding that has been 
going out from states to have uh, providers expand. They've been expanding on their own and using federal dollars as well. So we're, we already have a gap between what's physically available and what's published as available. So we definitely have a lag in terms of the data releases. And then the last one I'll mention on challenges is that the provider data is not thoroughly validated. Uh, so when we see issues with that information, you know, does it follow a logical network pattern? We have our telecom engineers that are reviewing this data and being able to identify areas that don't quite make sense or that need further investigation. Having that validation is really a great part of being able to verify who does and does not have that actual service. And so now some map examples. If we look at a provider that is able to provide broadband service in a town, you know, perhaps they're, they have a franchise agreement where they're supposed to be supplying cable service throughout the city limits. And so being able to represent that on the map within the city limits, but then you transition that to a census block representation and census block boundaries don't match up with city limits and town boundaries and municipalities all the time. So then you've got these extra areas that are getting reported as having service from that provider and technology, but it actually doesn't exist. So we're already dealing with overstatement just from that alone. And then that magnified by the approximately 3,200 different broadband providers that exist across the country, you're really exacerbating the issue. Another example, if a provider knows exactly which roads they serve, being able to identify those road segments and say, hey, we were able to offer fiber along these roads and conserve any of the houses that are along these roads. Uh, that certainly gives you one display of where service is available. And then of course, migrating that to a census block representation. Again, the same issues. Obviously we know that census blocks can be very odd shapes. And so having that type of data get transitioned to census blocks definitely creates some overstatement issues. And then the example for the fixed wireless propagations. We have uh, telecom engineers that are able to create these propagations. Basically, where is the signal propagating from a tower or other vertical asset location? And what does that physically look like? And then again, the transition to census block data. Uh, looking additionally at some of the comparisons between the actually published and filed form 477 data, uh, this is looking at a single provider. Again, the image on the left is showing the actual census block data that was filed with the FCC. And you can see it's kind of scattered a little bit. It's got a general shape, but it is scattered. On the middle photo in green, we worked with a provider to figure out, you know, where exactly do you serve? And let's skip the census blocks where if anybody within a shape called you for service, where would that be? So we developed this granular surface area. And then if we developed a census block map off of that more accurate service area in green, what should their filing have looked like? So you can see comparing the left and the right images that some census blocks were filed that they don't have service in and some were not filed that they do have service in. So this really contributes to the difference between the overstatement and the understatement of data. Another example from a fixed wireless provider, the image on the left looks a little funny. Um, it's actually just a, a very sprinkling, if you will, of census blocks that was were filed from this provider. And it turns out that their billing system had said, oh yeah, we can totally do your filing for you, no worries. And unfortunately it turned out that the billing system was only taking into account where they had current customers. So they were only filing the census blocks where customers currently existed instead of where they have full access. Um, so we worked with them again on the image in the middle in green to say, all right, give us your tower information. Um, it's got a couple dozen of inputs on there that our engineers are able to take and then create these propagations of where the signal is strong enough to meet minimum speeds. And then what should their census block filing have looked like on the right? So magnifying this by 3,200 providers. Some of them are absolutely getting it right. I, I don't want to disparage all the providers because there are some that are absolutely doing it right and getting the data filed the way they should based on the current instructions and technical parameters. But there are a significant number of providers that have had some challenges in trying to get from the data they do have into a location-based format and then follow the requirements that they are supposed to have with the FCC currently. 
Uh, last example I want to show is uh, we did a study in Walton County, Florida, and we started with the data that's kind of in the orange gold color. And that's basically the data from the FCC that said, oh, here are the census blocks where 25 by three is supposed to be available. And we had our engineering team drive every road in the county and document all of the telecom equipment, the assets, the infrastructure, and really start to develop a better picture of, well, how much of this is actually served and not served? And so zooming into this, the, the purple color is where we actually were able to verify the service was available. And so the orange slash gold that's still showing, those were all overstated. And then we also found understated areas where there were assets and infrastructure, but they weren't being reported. Um, so being able to, again, map that difference between where is service physically available and how many people are getting overlooked for funding and other opportunities to expand service because the data is not where it needs to be. So the good news is that the FCC is currently working to change this. They, they've certainly recognized the limitations of the data as it currently exists with the Form 477 and the census block reporting, and they are going to be migrating that. Uh, so in 2020, there was a, uh, the Broadband Data Act, which is basically what's uh, promoting this change and requiring the FCC to look at different ways of broadband provider reporting, making sure that data is more accurate. Um, and this is thought to eventually replace the Form 477. So the FCC is currently working on this as an upcoming data program. So what they're publishing right now, obviously we've talked a lot about the challenges that exist for uh, using census blocks as a measure of reporting. So that is all going to change. So broadband services moving forward are going to be reported in one of two ways. And because the FCC has recognized that some providers do have a challenge in not having resources for GIS or geospatial data, they can either submit polygon service areas. Uh, so where they're able to say, hey, any resident that isn't within the shape can call in and get service from us. That's what this represents. Or if they have a list of addresses that they know they can serve, that information can be submitted as well. So there's various technical parameters around this program that providers are going to have to abide by. It is mandatory. All broadband providers are supposed to be submitting this data, again, twice a year, just like the Form 477. Um, but this is going to yield a lot more accurate data because it's specific to each provider and technology, and it's about their service area, not anything related to census blocks. So we're going to be able to get more detailed information across the board. And then one other note I wanted to make on this is that, you know, we talk about serviceable addresses. But obviously, as we know, depending on the geocoder, that point could show up anywhere. So, you know, if somebody says 123 Main Street, where is that? And making sure that if there's six providers that serve 123 Main Street, that all six of them have the same exact point. So the underlying address data for this is being referenced as the broadband serviceable location fabric. Um, and or the fabric for short. And so what they're doing is essentially creating a national address database, not to be confused with the NAD that is uh, currently published by the Department of Transportation, but this is a, a separate data set that is going to pinpoint exactly which locations across the country, rooftop level accuracy, but being able to move forward and say, hey, this is where 123 Main Street is located and all, everybody is the same. It's all consistent across the board as far as what, what that address is and where that address is. Um, so being able to use that for the underlying data, that way we can really pinpoint where are the people that are still not served or they are underserved. Um, perhaps they have some level of internet access, but it's not quite good enough. Um, so that will really kind of under, underpin this new data collection when it comes out. So in terms of timing, um, the image on the right is directly from the FCC's site for the broadband data collection. Um, they're pretty much at the far end of this now, uh, the last two kind of boxes on the screen that are showing. Uh, they're currently working on some additional IT systems, and then they're also working to provide technical support to some of the smaller broadband providers that may not have GIS or any other geospatial resources to really develop this data. They've got to submit a shapefile or a geodatabase and they've never done that before, how do they get assistance on that? And the FCC is providing that with some funding they got from Congress to make sure that we're getting this right and get everybody connected. Um, so next on the list, the initial data collection for providers, that deadline is September 1st of this year. 
Uh, so their new portal is going to open up at the end of June, and then providers will be able to start submitting their new files as required by the FCC uh, to get this program started. And then using that data, uh, it's going to start shifting into being able to aggregate that. The FCC is going to take all this information, aggregate it together, and issue a brand new broadband map. Uh, we've heard either late this year, perhaps early next year, um, to get that data together and then start to inform some of these additional funding opportunities that are coming up. And I will actually turn it over to Eric now to uh, go over what some of those funding opportunities are going to be. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, this is the this is the part where we start to, to answer the question, why do we care? Um, and the, the answer is that the Infrastructure Act provides states, communities, and, and internet service providers with an ample amount of resources to close, or at least to attempt to close, our availability digital divide. So the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act that was passed last year uh, created, it had 65 billion in it for broadband infrastructure and digital equity. And there's four main funding programs and then some other policy related things that are going on. Um, and I'm gonna focus on, on really two of them. One is the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program and the other is the Digital Equity Act. And so these programs are, are really why we need to care about making sure our broadband maps are accurate. If you go to the next slide, Ashley. All right, so the BEAD program uh, for short is, is about $42 billion for broadband infrastructure. Now to put that into scale, uh, back during the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act days, the ARA funding back during the 2008 recession and, 2000, and 2009 response act, there was about $7 billion for broadband nationwide. Now we're talking about $42 billion nationwide for broadband infrastructure. And the way this, the, this, these funds are gonna be distributed is through formula-based grants to states. So unlike past federal funding programs for broadband where the federal government was the, the, the grantor, the, you know, the FCC, the NTIA, the National Telecom and Information Administration, the USDA is another big broadband funder, and they would give those grants directly to grantees, whether it's a community or an ISP. The difference now is that the BEAD program is gonna be implemented by states. So states are going to, going to be the primary administrator of $42 billion in broadband infrastructure funds. Uh, so again, these are gonna be uh, formula-based allocations to states. And I'll get back to that formula in a second. Um, so states will get their money, uh, they will administer it through a competitive subgrant process. And the, the Infrastructure Act really very clearly defines the locations that need to be served um, and in priority order with these funds. So the first are locations, so households and businesses that don't have 25 by three megabits per second. So getting back to that speed discussion that Ashley said earlier. Um, so those are considered unserved. So priority one for states is going to direct investment from these federal funds to places in the state that don't have 25 by three. Once they have a plan and funds start flowing to, to, to serve those places, the state can then move on to serving uh, locations that don't have 100 by 20 megabits per second. Um, so those are considered underserved areas. And then finally, once both of those uh, location categories are, are, have a plan and funds are starting to flow, then states can focus on connecting community anchor institutions. So our libraries, our schools, our healthcare facilities, public safety, uh, government offices, and so on that have less than a gigabit per second. Uh, so these are, the, these are the areas that states are going to have to prioritize funding for uh, to spend their, inf their broadband infrastructure funds. Um, the, the, the key part and why, and why it's so important for the FCC to have accurate data and for states to have accurate data and for communities to have accurate data is because as part of the planning process to get these funds, states have to identify every location within their borders that meets those three priority areas. Um, and I'm going to answer that question that just came through in the chat in, in just a second. Um, so, because it is a little bit of a, of a conflict here. So states are going to have to identify their own locations that meet these three uh, priority criterias. However, where the conflict comes in is that the NTIA, so the federal agency that is administering these funds, is going to rely on these, this new FCC map to determine how much money each state gets. And so it's critically important that when the first iteration of the FCC map is published, states have their own accurate information to be able to challenge any inaccuracies that might, that might occur in that first cut of the new FCC map. 
Um, so once that uh, the FCC map is published, the FCC will open up a challenge period where states, communities, other ISPs, and others with, with uh, verifiable uh, service information can submit that to the FCC to challenge that map. And those challenges then will hopefully result in a more accurate federal map, which then the NTA will use to calculate every state's allocation of this $42 billion. Um, and so the FCC is the ultimate keeper of you know, defining the unserved and underserved areas, but states and communities are gonna play a big role in making sure that that federal data set is accurate moving forward. Um, so the timing of all this is, is a little goofy uh, in that the, the, the new FCC data um, uh, won't be, is, isn't due until September 1st of this year, like Ashley was saying, um, but the, the, these funds are starting to get planned for at the state level now. Uh, we expect the notice of funds for this program to actually be published this Friday. And so states will know a lot more about it. Um, so th there's, there's a lot of money out there or coming for broadband. Uh, there's a matching fund component to this as well. Be, uh, so a 25% minimum match. And so we're really talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars available for broadband infrastructure and making sure that that data is accurate is absolutely paramount. I'll go ahead to the next one, Ashley. Hey, Eric, but before you dive into this one, there's another question that just came in that might be better if we tackle it now. Yep, just let me read in through a second. Um, so when it comes to those speed definitions, they have to have both of the, uh, the download and upload sides of that equation to meet the criteria. So if a, if a location has, let's say 100 by 10 megabits per second, they would not meet the criteria of 100 by 20. Uh, so they have to meet both sides of that, uh, of that speed requirement in order, um, or, or they will be defined as um, unserved or underserved. So I, does that answer that question? So I, I think the question may be getting at, is there any sort of priority in the BEAD program if they have more than 100, but they have less than 20 to kind of look at it as lower hanging fruit, or does it not distinguish uh, b b between the, uh, the, uh, the two elements there and just see it as, nope, you're underserved? Um, that's going to have to be a question to answer after the notice of funds comes out because there might be some more clarity coming from the NTIA on situations like that. Um, the Infrastructure Act is a little bit, it, it's clear in that it, it's, it's a little more black and white. If you don't have 100 by 20, you're un underserved, but there might be some, some further guidance in the notice of funds on those places that you know, are a little, you know, that you, like the 110, 100 by 10 example I just gave, um, that might give a little bit more guidance on situations like that, but hopefully we'll know on Friday um, or early next week. Uh, the other question here is about counties in the state requesting money to tackle some of the issues. And again, this is something that um, I think the notice of funds is going to be clearer on, and, and that's how states can distribute those funds, whether it's as a subgrant process directly to eligible. Um, plans and distribute to internet service providers. There's still a lot of question marks, and that's definitely one of them is how states can uh, administer those funds and what are some of the guidelines um, um, uh, surrounding that. So we'll just have to wait and see for that notice of funds. So the, the other concurrent program that states are gonna be implementing apart from BEAD is the Digital Equity Act. And there are two, uh, two components of that act uh, that states are gonna be administering. One is, the, is a digital equity plan that states will create for their, uh, for, for their citizens. And the other then is implementation funds, follow on implementation funds. Uh, to address digital equity and inclusion. Um, so this one, uh, obviously, we, we've been talking a lot about availability data and where networks are and are not, and who has service and at what speed and so on. But data, I think, is equally as important for digital equity. Under, better understanding how and where folks are not adopting broadband, where are our affordability issues, where are our device issues, um, is something that is not as black and white, I think, as infrastructure. And so it's very, it's, it's, it's a much tougher challenge to, uh, to gather data on, on the digital equity and adoption side of things, but there are some data sets out there that can help at least start down that path. So the, um, the American Community Survey certainly has information on uh, broadband adoption by technology type, by income, 
and, and other factors. But I think as states look to create digital equity plans and then of course implement, I think it's gonna be really important to come up with the data strategy to address that side of the house as well. So we have our BEAD, um, the BEAD funding for that is focused heavily on infrastructure, but then I think states need to equally look at how data can help better define and direct implementation funds to address digital equity um, too, which of course deals with um, uh, affordability devices, digital literacy, and so on. Um, so I think there needs to be a, a, a robust discussion around data, um, uh, especially, specifically geographic data on where investment in digital equity should occur. So Ashley, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. So, and now having that information, knowing that there is some additional information coming from the federal government about how these funds are to be used, how we're going to be able to apply for them, whether it's at a state level, a county level, perhaps, or if counties need to go through the states, whatever that kind of situation needs to be, what are things that we can be doing now as geospatial professionals? How can I prepare for this? What type of information is out there? Um, and so the number one question would be, did, did your state have a broadband officer agency that handles broadband activities. And I've just got a few examples on the right side. It, there's not a lot of um, consistency state by state in terms of what type of agency is in charge of this or whether they have a broadband office, um, whatever they may call it or whoever, whatever agency is actually handling all of this information or mapping or grants programs, whatever that may look like. You know, Does your state have something like that? Did they have additional data rather than using the FCC Form 477 currently, because that is the one that's available until we get the new FCC BDC data, what are we gonna be able to use now? And your state may already have some additional data that potentially could be shared, or they may have interactive maps or other applications that you could be able to use some of that information to start planning for what's coming. Uh, the next question would be, you know, does your jurisdiction have reliable address level data? And being able to use that, whether you all participate in the National Address Database, um, submitting that data to uh, DOT, or whether it's something your local community has a better handle on, do you have better address data? So that when somebody says, hey, 123 Main Street, we believe is served by these three providers, but is the geography correct? Is that location showing up in the right place, according to the FCC? That's something that we can be preparing for now. Another thing that states and organizations have done is either conducting surveys or they've collected resident feedback on broadband access and adoption. Do you have access at home? If you do, who are you using? Are your speeds sufficient? If you don't have service, is it because it physically doesn't exist or because you have some other barrier to adopting it, like not having a device, the cost is too high? Whatever that barrier might be, collecting additional information because it can either feed into the bead money that's available by identifying unserved and underserved locations, or it could feed into the digital equity part that Eric was talking about, being able to take it a step further and say, hey, this, these locations already have service, but they need additional funding or training or digital literacy or something to get them more involved in the digital economy. Uh, the next part is being able to prepare for this challenge process, um, being able to challenge the fabric uh, like I mentioned, the FCC has an underlying data set that's going to be used for this process and the new broadband data collection data, being able to overlay provider uh, broadband provider service areas on top of this address location data. But say 123 Main Street from the FCC isn't showing up where you believe 123 Main Street is based on your local information and data. You'll be able to challenge that. And so having that address level data uh, will really help prepare for making sure that these locations are showing up in the right spot. Because if we're overlaying with other geospatial data and we're off a little bit, that can mean the difference between that location showing up as served, underserved, or unserved. And that will affect the funding that's going to be eligible for your state or community. Uh, the other part of the challenge is going to be on the accuracy of the broadband data. So if a provider is going to uh, be supplying this information to the FCC and say, hey, here's my cable service area where we've got at least 100 by 20 speeds. Well, perhaps they've overstated a neighborhood that doesn't actually have service, or they've missed a neighborhood that just got connected, but it wasn't in their most recent filing. You'll be able to challenge that data as well. Um, so whether you are an agency or even just yourself as a resident, there will be a challenge process available for you to provide that level of feedback. 
Some additional ways to prepare. Um, these, this slide goes a little bit more in depth than the previous one, uh, but looking at conducting independent research on available data. Um, so while we've said that the, the Form 477 data from the FCC does have limitations, it is the best available or the most complete data set that exists across the entire country. Some states have much better data sets than 477 already. And then of course, as you reach out to uh, your state agency or broadband office to see what they have available or if they haven't gotten started or if they're just getting underway, uh, trying to see what status of your state is, you can conduct some additional independent research, um, especially if you've collected information or resonant feedback on, you know, hey, the map says I have service, but I really don't. Or, hey, the map says I have three providers, but I checked and two of them said no, one of them said yes. That is the level of detail that is needed to make sure that the data is as accurate as it possibly can be. Uh, so along those same lines, developing more accurate and detailed broadband maps, uh, being able to um, establish relationships with providers, we'll go into more detail about that in just a minute. And then also conducting field validation in targeted areas. So if you have those anecdotes about, hey, we've heard that this area is not as well served as some of the maps and other information say they are, there's additional field validation that can be done with telecom engineers to go and basically, you know, what is the truth in this area? You know, this side says there is service, this side says there isn't. Somebody has to go in and confirm what the truth in that area is. And field validation is a good very neutral way to do that, to find out where the assets and infrastructure, what are they capable of, and how does the map need to adjust based on those findings. Um, and then certainly being able to submit verified broadband data. The FCC, in addition to the challenge process, has made a, a section available where verified entities, whether it's at the state or local locations, you'll be able to file verified broadband data. So um, like the the logos I showed on the previous page from some of the state agencies that are currently doing broadband work, uh, they will be able to register to file verified broadband data in some form. There are future uh, additional details coming out about that, but there will be an opportunity if a state has collected already more detailed data or done field validation, they'll be able to submit some of that information as well. And then one of the other things is preparing for what are considered bulk challenges. Uh, so where I as a resident might file for my specific address, there's also an opportunity for uh, government agencies and entities, whether you're state or local, to be able to say, hi, you know, hey, we FCC, we've reviewed the address locations for our jurisdiction and here's, a, you know, here are all the ones we want to challenge that we don't believe they're in the right location. Um, you'll be able to do some bulk challenges to help advance that data. And certainly with the NAD, if your state or locality uh, participates in that, you'll be able to use some of that data as well to kind of look at what the fabric says and then be able to challenge that information on a bulk level instead of just one by one. Uh, so wrapping up, the one last thing I wanted to go over was what are some things that states and local jurisdictions are doing now? What are some of the projects and programs that are taking place to really prepare locations for all of the things that are coming, whether it's the new FCC broadband data collection, whether it's the federal funding, that's gonna come down through the states and other locations. What are states currently doing that can help them in this process? So one of the things I wanted to bring up is kind of this, this partly holistic approach on doing the independent research, finding what databases exist, finding uh, are there different permits and licensing things that different providers have or do not have in certain areas that would allow them to you know, have a fixed wireless system, whatever the case might be, that independent research then coupled with provider relationships. So being able to work with providers, uh, like I mentioned earlier, where are they at? Not being able to say, oh, hey, I need a geodatabase of your network system as it currently exists. A lot of them don't have any idea what that means. So being able to establish relationships to say, you know, hey, we're really trying to get a better handle on where services do and do not exist, and then see what type of information they have to then work with that and you know, try to shape it into a standardized format so that you can aggregate that with everybody else's data and then try to say, all right, there's five providers at this location, there's zero over here, um, and really be able to work back and forth on that. A third part is gonna be the field validation, having telecom engineers go out into the field and actually do data collections from scratch to show here's where the assets are, here's what type they are, what they're capable of, and then similarly with the infrastructure and be able to say, all right, here's the fiber route. Oh, this one's fiber to the home. This one's fiber transport. So that kind of the interstate version. 
of the middle mile broadband we talked about at the very beginning. Um, and then the fourth part is the resident feedback, being able to have literal impact from people that live in the area to say, hey, I called this provider and they're a quarter mile away from me. Or they, you know, I have a half mile long driveway. They can't reach me without charging me $60,000. Getting that level of feedback is also going to help develop more accurate maps, more detailed information, and provide that level of information that we can then file as either a challenge or verified data with the FCC. And so um, just closing out, we've got some additional maps to kind of show what different states and locations are doing. Uh, this is an example from Texas that recently uh, published a series of maps that said, all right, if we look at different speeds and so we can see um, as we go from left to right, the speeds are increasing. So on the far left, we're looking at 10 by one speeds or 10 meg down and one meg up. And then all going all the way to the right, we're looking at 100 meg down and 10 meg up. And so you can see the green starts to disappear the higher the speeds you get because more people are unserved at those higher speeds. Um, so what we're really looking at in terms of that bead funding is identifying the areas that are not in green, who doesn't have service at what speeds, and that will help determine those priority areas for where funding will be directed. Iowa is another great example. They have been doing some broadband mapping. Uh, this interactive map is showing where 25 by 3 technology is available and the different colors are representing the different technology types. Um, so being able to then aggregate all that together to figure out, again, where are those gaps in service so that people know where to focus those efforts. Uh, for residents and for uh, states and, and local communities alike, there's also parts of the interactive maps that are able to show, you know, hey, let me put in my address and see what the data says my house should be able to get. And being able to get that list and then go check out the provider websites or be able to call them to say, you know, hey, I, I would like to get this service at my location. If you don't have broadband, um, we've heard that there are a lot of people that are using libraries and community centers to do this type of research. So being able to provide this type of information and say, you know, hey, here are the different providers that might be available at your location, call them. And then if it doesn't work out, let us know so that we can correct the maps and say, you know, oh, hey, this. This, this area isn't served by this provider, we need to correct that. Um, but being able to provide as much detail as possible to get more understanding of what service is actually available. Um, and then kind of uh, steering off of that, having a resident feedback form, being able to say, hey, I looked at the map and it's wrong. And here's what's wrong about it. Or, you know, hey, I looked at it and, you know, I do have this service that's listed there, but I'm not getting the speeds I'm supposed to get. What can I do about that? So any level of detail on feedback we're able to receive, we can use that to then reach back out to the providers and say, you know, hey, looks like we're getting a lot of feedback from people in this neighborhood. Looks like we need to update the map or this needs to be taken off or, you know, are you all getting there soon? And that's why this data is published on the map currently. Whatever type of feedback there is, it's, should, it should be actionable um, based on what the local people have provided and said, here's my situation, how do I help fix that? And then just a few other examples, being able to aggregate all that data together. Um, this example from Michigan uh, is showing the density of providers. And so the darker the colors, the more providers there are offering service to a location. And so the lighter colors and where they just flat out don't exist, that, those are some of the areas that are gonna need the most attention. Uh, we also have some states that have started grant programs. Uh, so Minnesota has had a grant program for several years now where they take each iteration of the map and go, all right, where are my unserved areas? Where are my underserved areas? And make them eligible for grants. So very similar to what BEAD is about to do, but they've been doing this for several years and have made a lot of progress on identifying areas that are unserved, making them eligible for grants, providers apply for those grants, get funded, and then there's an extra layer of transparency as well, where all those areas are double checked to, and confirmed to have built out exactly the way that it was expected and that the local residents are able to receive the speeds that were anticipated. A lot of testing goes on to confirm that. And then the state is able to kind of mark off different areas is now being served. And so the map on the right is showing since 2014, where are all these different project areas where service has now been expanded to because of the grant level funding. Um, and so several states have taken that approach already and have already been building out to different areas. Another thing states have been doing or different locations have been doing rather is doing asset mapping, 
trying to figure out well, where are the vertical assets that exist in my community? Because then if I compare that with where broadband services are already available and then look at where it's not, I might be able to use some of those vertical assets to expand service. Um, so if we look in the, the bottom right here, you can see there's a point that's actually a, a grain silo in an unserved area. And so that, depending on who owns it, making sure it already has power, if it's got fiber backhaul leading up to that, then we can use that instead of constructing a brand new tower, having to do an environmental impact study, having to go through all of these steps, we've already got an asset. We might be able to put wireless equipment on it to go ahead and connect the people in that area that aren't currently served. Um, so being able to collect different assets like that and moving forward with a plan of how to get people connected. And then the very last example we've got, this is more considered asset and infrastructure mapping. Uh, so being able to go to a very specific uh, county, community, and just drive every single road within that location and have telecom engineers actually track and do data collections that say, here's all the fiber we found, here's who owns it, here's all the copper, here's all the different assets that we found, where all the towers are located, where all the fiber markers are on the ground, and be able to do this literally with just people on the ground collecting this data um, to figure out where are we served and unserved, because now we can use this data, compare it to either FCC data or data we've received from providers to figure out, all right, how does the infrastructure line up with those broadband service areas? Because if there's not infrastructure, there's likely not residential service. So then we can work with those providers and really figure out where do we need to trim or cut different service areas to be more accurate. So a lot of information can be gleaned from this type of uh, mapping that some communities and states have taken on to really get a better idea of where services are and are not. So a lot of activities across, um, across the board there. And so with that, um, I think, Matt, we are ready to open it up for questions. Excellent. And boy, there are some, uh, are some great questions. Um, so the first one, uh, is there a reason why a provider would under or over report the data besides just not understanding the current reporting system? Um, are, are there potentially more malicious reasons? Unfortunately, yes. Um, so if a, if a provider kind of wants to, I'll call it protect their service area, um, they might submit additional data or census blocks or a service area that says, hey, I'm already here, but they may not actually be there yet because they don't want that area to be defined as unserved or underserved and have some uh, competitor move in either next door or right on top of them. So unfortunately, that is something that could occur if a provider uh, wants to try to protect their service area, that can definitely happen. Um, but there is, with this upcoming uh, BDC, the broadband data collection with the FCC, there are more stringent rules on what needs to be filed and more opportunities for fines and things to basically prohibit that because there is going to be validation on those areas to make sure they're correct. And providers can literally get fined a lot of money for misrepresenting or misreporting, whether it's malicious or on accident. So there is a lot of pressure on both the FCC and the providers to make sure that this data is completely as accurate as possible. All right, excellent. Uh, another question, um, are there any data sets available to address the question of latency or is that just more the analysis of what technologies are available in different areas or the infrastructure that's set up in, in, a, in a particular locale? Uh, latency is definitely an interesting question. Um, there's not a national, at least not that I'm aware of, a, a national database that addresses the issue of latency. Um, and so latency being the, the lag that it takes for your device to actually get to the internet or send something. Um, there's traditionally higher latency with satellite because you're trying to get, you're bouncing your signal from your location up to the satellite back to you. Um, so there's a lot shorter latency in terms of if you've got, for instance, fiber to the home service. Um, so there's not a, a database that I'm aware of that tracks that for every single provider, but there is there are data collections that have occurred um, where it's more mostly in a um, either a provider by provider basis or a community basis where that data is being collected and those tests are being done either on the equipment, um, on the broadband equipment themselves to be able to test that and go, you know, hey, this is within 
reasonable values or if there is a certain program where it says, you know, hey, hey, provider, we're going to give you this funding to expand to this area, but it has to be at least these speeds and it has to be a maximum latency of X, uh, whatever that might look like. So there are different data collections going on there, but not something that's widely available already. All right. Excellent. Um... So about the digital equity piece, uh, do you know if the plan is to incorporate uh, school districts or demographics based on school districts uh, into that, especially since school buildings and facilities are usually seen as uh, community anchor institutions? Yeah, I, I definitely think schools are going to be a big part of the digital equity plan and solutions and implementation too. Um, it, it'll really be depending dependent on each state on how they craft their digital equity plan and, and some of the solutions they look at. But I, I can't imagine educational institutions being left out of that um, as they are absolutely critical to reaching vulnerable populations and others that struggle with you know, the, those different elements of the digital divide. Excellent. Thanks, Eric. And that kind of leads into the, the next question. Um, you know, kind of wondering, is there evidence that administering programs through the states, uh, and, and Ashley, you had some, some great slides, some great examples of states that have continued programs, uh, might be more effective uh, than administering this from the, uh, the federal level directly to applicants? Um, that's, that's a good question. I'm going to ask, if, if, see, I'll, I'll see if Ashley has any uh, additional response to that, but I think what's I don't know why the what the motivation was to 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 have Congress, you know, have states be the administrator of those funds when they wrote the Infrastructure Act, but I think some of it might have to do with you know the success of state-based broadband grants grant programs over the years. Since the end of the state broadband initiative back in very early 2015, many states have spun up their own broadband grant programs and have been very successful at it. Um, and so I think they saw that success. I think there's some trust that states know their states best and how things should be implemented, where service needs to be. So I think that had a lot to do with it, um, but there's more specific motivation. I'm not, I'm not sure yet beyond speculation. Yeah, Matt, I would, I would say something similar just in terms of, you know, it, when, they, when they wrote it, it wasn't entirely clear, but yeah, there's, it varies across the board. I mean, just like us being geospatial professionals, you know, we've seen the difference in the types of data that exist or how concentrated um, a GIS office might be at a state level. And so there's definitely differences in terms of the broadband level of detail as well. All right, excellent. Um, and, and there's a question that, that came in. I'm gonna try to work it in with, with another question as well. You know, so, um, so certainly, um, you know, providers, uh, even though they have these reporting requirements, you know, may view their infrastructure data as proprietary. You know, they're in competition with, 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 with other folks. It means something to them. Uh, but there's also the, uh, the, the interesting angle that, you know, like other forms of infrastructure data, uh, sometimes it's considered secure or exempt from FOIA uh, because of the, of the security requirements. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of wondering uh, your thoughts on, on that, if, if you're seeing changes uh, from providers, especially as these new reporting elements are, are pushed across. And, and, and I'd also like to weave in, you know, talking about this, uh, this fabric of, of addresses and, and developing this new data set for, uh, for this purpose, you know, that isn't the, the NAD, the National Address Database. Um, is there any thought to restrict access to the fabric behind a uh, federal title like is commonly done or well, like is done uh, with some of the census data and post office data? Okay, so a few different questions there. And I know Eric's gotta, gotta jump as well, but um, in terms of the infrastructure data, um, and the confidentiality piece. Um, there have been providers that, you know, they're not comfortable with sharing a ton of details on their networks um, and information, um, but it's getting to be more and more public. Um, so the FCC broadband map that currently exists, you can uh, kind of find an individual provider service area already. And based on the new requirements of the BDC providers, will have to be able to be um, 
you'll be able to uniquely identify a provider service area and then also the underlying address data. Um, so there are still some concerns. Um, one of the biggest things, like the very last map that I showed that was asset mapping, um, you, you can go out and find the assets and the infrastructure. As long as you know what you're looking for, um, we can, you know, you can find that information. And so it is out there already. Um, and you can find it and you can map it and you can collect it, aggregate it, et cetera. So the providers are moving towards um, a more, um, more sharing in, in public information. Uh, regarding the address level question with the fabric, that remains to be seen. Um, currently, like as of today, uh, there is uh, preliminary access to the fabric data, and that is only for the provider community. Um, and then the FCC is working with their vendor on creating a, a more finalized version of that data, at least for this initial data submission from the providers. Um, but right now, the licensing is unclear. States will be able to apply and see that information, um, but that also is not exactly public just yet or how, how a state gets to apply and do a, a license agreement to access that data. Um, so that part is not quite clear just yet. All right, and uh, speed round, um, who is the FCC's vendor? Uh, for the fabric, they're called CostQuest Associates. And they've been an FCC vendor for, for quite some time. So they've got a lot of experience working with the FCC. All right, so I believe Catherine has, has joined us and can unmute and ask a question. The other questions that came into chat uh, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that Ashley and Eric have and figure out how to uh, follow up with answers to those. Catherine? Hi, thanks, Matt. Um, I just wanted to know, uh, the grants are for, uh, the grants are given by the states to the providers. Is that correct? Uh, it, it depends. If we're talking about um, some of the already existing uh, programs that states have for mm -hmm. broadband expansion, like Minnesota has border to border broadband expansion grant program, they are issuing grants directly to the providers to expand service in particular areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we're talking about the bead and the new funding from the infrastructure bill, um, that part remains to be seen exactly how the states are going to be allowed to administer those funds. Right, like so. If 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 a community had its own engineers that wanted to go out and do it, they could they could grant themselves the money. Is that uh, the state could grant it to the community? It doesn't have to be to a carrier. We we will hopefully get all the details of that uh, within the next week. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Yeah, no problem. All right, thank you, everyone, uh, for for so many great questions, and Ashley for uh, fielding those like. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I guess like a GIS professional uh, would, would be the way to say that. Uh, uh, well done with the with the uh, firing squad line. Uh, as as we uh, we wrap up, uh, you know, here at ERISA, uh, we strive to support geospatial professionals at all stages of their careers with essential training and resources. I'd like to thank Ashley and Eric and the folks at Connected Nation for uh, for uh, really helping us meet this today on the very timely topic. Of, uh, of broadband and, and what's new and what's changing and, and what's coming up with that. Uh, just uh, up on, up on the, uh, the slide, uh, on, the, uh, on the screen are some of the other upcoming uh, URSA events. Uh, and so uh, if you'd like more information, more detail uh, about those, the, uh, the free online ones, the, the, uh, uh, some of the virtual workshops we have coming up, some of the in-person events, uh, more information about all of those uh, can be found on the ERISA website at ERISA.org. Uh, so thank you uh, again, Ashley, and uh, thank you everybody for your time today. And uh, we'll see you at another ERISA event uh, somewhere in the future.